the Dim Din Podcast, a safe space to talk about misconceptions, perceptions, assumptions, and frustrations. Join us for conversations and stories that explore how embracing our differences leads to a balanced, strong, and harmonious world. Hello and welcome to the Dim Dim Podcast, your very safe space to have conversations about misconceptions, perceptions, assumptions and frustrations amongst Africans here in the diaspora. I am your host, Becca, the Syrian Indian. Today we're here to discuss another sensitive but relevant um, topic. And to have this conversation, this conversation with me today, I have with me my fathers in the community. We have a father from Ghana and two of my fathers from Sierra Leone. I'll pass it over to them to introduce themselves and we'll start with um, Elderly. <laughs> um, what a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Um, this is a topic that is very um, essential and very necessary for our community. So I'm very glad to be part of the conversation. Thank you very much. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and also would like to know a fun fact or a historical fact about your country of birth, Ghana? Um, let me talk about Ghana more than to talk about myself. <laughs> um, Ghana is the gateway to the continent in terms of um, our connection to the global diaspora. Mm. So um, Ghana is the place where any diaspora can connect to. So once you are a diaspora, your gateway to Africa is Ghana. Mm. And when you are in Ghana, please do visit the Elmina Castle. Uh, there's a particular place there that I would like you to be connected to. It's called the Door of No Return. Mm. So when you go there, go to Elmina, make sure physically you go through that door, which means that you've come to register with the land of Africa that you are back to the original source. And that will be the emotional and spiritual connection I expect every diaspora to make when you visit Ghana and use Ghana as a platform to visit other African countries, Senegal, uh, Nigeria, Benin, uh, South Africa, Ethiopia, Angola, Namibia. And all the countries have a historical point to um, visit. Beautiful, beautiful. Wow, the gates of no return. Thank you very much, Ni. We'll pass it on to you, Daddy. Thank you very much. They had um, start to follow. Um, Patrick Sisse, I'm happy to be here. Really excited to engage in this topic. I'm from Sierra Leone, um, one of the four British West African colonies in West Africa, including Ghana, Nigeria, and the Gambia. Sierra Leone um, historically is called referred to as the Athens of Africa. Mm. And the reason it's referred to as the Athens of Africa, it's in relation to civilization as well as the introduction of uh, what we would call academic knowledge, mm. like the oldest university, for example, in the sub-region, Furabe College, was built in Sierra Leone. Mm. And there was a time when the colonial masters, I know we don't want to go down into the colonial pathway, they were more or less like based out of Sierra Leone, because Sierra Leone has a free town, which is a capital city, mm -hmm. has a natural harbor. So ships were able to land very easily mm -hmm. and they were able to settle and uh, do most of their colonizing from that base in mm -hmm. Sierra Leone free town. There's a lot of fun facts about Sierra Leone. Religious tolerance is quite unique in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm from parents who are Muslim and Christian and mm -hmm. um, religious tolerance, like I said, is quite uh, unique mm -hmm. in Sierra Leone. So, so many fun facts and valuable things about Sierra Leone. Beautiful. So the gateway and the Athens. Thank you both very much. We'll pass it on to you. <laughs> uh, my, my name is Kemal Mansouri and uh, it is uh, difficult and hard to follow mm -hmm. after these two wonderful gentlemen have spoken. Uh, interestingly, uh, <coughs> I'm also from Sierra and one thing that uh, probably the, rela the connection Canada has to Sierra Leone, the first 1,500 slaves who were freed in Nova Scotia were sent to Freetown. Mm. 
Mm. From that is the link between Sierra Leone and Canada. And if you go to Nova Scotia, you'll actually see some of those historical facts about the connection between Sierra Leone and uh, and uh, <coughs> Canada. And one interesting thing that I found out today that uh, uh, <coughs> the gentleman <laughs> sitting uh, near me here is my senior. We went to the <laughs> same school uh, in uh, Sierra Leone and. Uh, I won't say much here. I have to control <laughs> myself, or else uh, I would be uh, giving some historical facts that I need to know about attending a boarding school. <laughs> so it's a privilege for me to be among these uh, young people here. Yeah. Well, thank you all so very much. OK, so now to the topic of the day. In about eight months, we lost about three members of our family, my paternal grandpa, my paternal grandma, and my paternal um, uncle. And this was a heavy period for us because, of course, three people lost in eight months. Not enough time to fully understand each loss or even grieve each loss. We were far away from home, and I personally did not get a chance to go back and say goodbye or say my last goodbye any of these individuals. This was the very reason that I started thinking about this topic in a different way. I wonder how many people go through grief and loss here in the diaspora, having to grieve the loss of their loved one back home, and what that looks like for each individual. And because of that today, we're going to talk about the frustration that we experience as Africans here in the diaspora as we try to grieve the loss of our loved ones. There's no better people to have this conversation with me today than my elders and fathers here who have each experienced a different kind of loss and have had to go through that process in their own way. It is a heavy conversation for sure, but we'll take our time and talk about it and give it the detail that it does deserve. I'll pass it back over to my fathers to talk a little bit about their experience of the different types of loss that they have had and how they went about grieving that loss. Can I start with you, Mr. Kemal? Sure. <coughs> As I said, my name is Kemal Mansuri. Uh, uh, a few years ago, I lost my son, uh, who was in Africa, and uh, grieving is individualized, uh, but again, it is community, it is culture, but uh, it is uh, something that takes a little bit of time. Uh, I lost my son, whom I have been trying to bring uh, to Canada since I immigrated to Canada. Unfortunately, when I was immigrating to Canada, I was not able to bring my son. And so I tried, I tried. Uh, the immigration system failed me. And then I tried to go back to meet with my son. And I, at one point, he actually asked me, Dad, I just want to see you. I know you're doing everything for me. I just want to see you. And I was busy with school and other things here, and I was not able to go. Mm. And then I was driving to Lloydminster, uh, where I walk. I walk out of town. And uh, the moment I reached my apartment, I got a call from Sierra Leone that uh, that early, I think it was around 12 midnight, that uh, my son has passed. My son, I spoke with my son two days prior. He went to the beach, played soccer with friends, came home, and he was not, uh, he's gone. Mm -hmm. So I had to inform my manager that I, I had just left Edmonton on the Sunday to go work because I usually leave Edmonton and go to, Ed, uh, to Lloydminster to work. And 
I had to leave at Lloydminster again the following morning to come back to Edmonton. And usually that trip takes me around two and a half hours uh, of driving, three hours. That day the, the trip took me about f five hours to drive back because I had to stop on the way so whilst I was uh, taking to put that into perspective. Prior to that, I had planned to go to Salem now to meet my son uh, in December mm -hmm. of that year. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he passed away two months prior. Uh, that was the same time we were actually uh, facing the loss of the three Liberian women here. Yeah, yes. So we had lo just lost uh, three women in a car accident, and I was the president of the community at that time, and we were I was deeply involved in that, and then came the news of my son passing. So uh, in a nutshell, that's, uh, it took me time, and it took me um, uh, definitely uh, uh, you know, even thinking about it now, when I was coming back from Lloydminster, uh, for every stop, I will stop, cry to myself. And I was, there are a few things that was going with me. I was feeling guilty for not working hard to bring my son to Canada. I was feeling guilty of actually abandoning him there, even though I've done so many, so much for him while he was there. I, I sent him to both school uh, because I wanted him to actually experience, uh, he was attending in Freetown, I sent him to both schools so that he can actually uh, go to the same school that I attended. But uh, <clears throat> there are so many mixed em emotions that I was going through. and. Uh, that trip took me long, and people were worried for me here uh, when I, because they didn't hear from me, and the, the trip has taken too long from Lloydminster, which usually is not. Mm -hmm. And my wife and my family here were facing another challenge. Mm -hmm. I had two young children who were in elementary, uh, who are the siblings of my son. How are they going to tell them? about the loss of a brother that they have not seen yet. And they were longing to meet their brother. And now that brother is no more. So they have to skillfully, and my wife uh, was not able to, and my adopted mom, my Sutumara, uh, came home to, and they picked the kids from daycare uh, whilst I was still driving to actually reveal the message to uh, my children. So probably um, <clears throat> I came and uh, once I arrived in Edmonton, I think things changed. I kind of, uh, uh, my, my whole emotions have gone away and all the things I start building it out mm -hmm. because the community president having a loss and uh, so I wanted to man it up, mm -hmm. but uh, I was going through those uh, those emotions and stuff. And prior to that, I have been the one counseling people in the community as a community president for people who are losing loved ones. Mm. And I was actually there helping people, not only from the Salem community, but other communities that uh, were facing similar situations. But here I was, not able to handle my own loss at that time. So in a short span, the community rallied. My family rallied, the community rallied, the community, there was an outpour of community support. Mm -hmm. uh, Lots and lot of people for the days that I spent uh, uh, here before I left for Freetown. Uh, financial support was there. Emotional support was there. Uh, food and people uh, came to my uncle's house, slept over for the couple of days to see that I go through that. But it's totally different. Mm -hmm. uh, after all the dust is settled, and you're left alone, grieving is totally different.
and as yes. an individual when you lost somebody. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that would be uh, part. So that is just uh, an introduction of my loss, mm -hmm. and then we'll go further into uh, that. Um, uh, I've lost my parents, uh, both of my parents, mm -hmm. prior, mm -hmm. but my son, and comparing that to when I lose my parents, who are very close to me, mm -hmm. is totally different. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, I'm sorry for your loss of the loss of your son and that of your parents. Um, and you've, you're definitely starting us off on the path that we need to be, and I appreciate your input. And yes, a lot of things come up guilt-related, but knowing the man that you are, I'm pretty sure even though you were not able to bring your son, you did a lot to support him with what, you did a lot with what you had at the time. But we'll come back to the resources piece and the support that is available here in the diaspora. Over to you, Daddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think to address that question, I will go back to a particular day um, last year. I believe it was sometime in June. I was going with my wife and my boys who we were going to a hospital to do some just scanning tests for my son. And then, uh, fortunately, my wife was driving. <coughs> and then my phone rang. And it was my eldest brother who called to say, Papa is at the point of death. And I said, point of death? What do you mean? My dad is elderly, and he has not, he's not been very well, but very strong. And I said, where are you? He said, at, the hospit uh, at home. Don't let him die at home. Take him to the hospital, was the direction I gave. So they eventually took him to the hospital and then uh, they were able to support him during that time. The one thing with grief and loss, I think having a very strong family supporting you is very important. Because mm -hmm. in that short space, my wife and I sat down and spoke and then he, she could read me like a book and ask, you should go, go and see him. So I called my dad and said, hey, I'm coming. And I don't know if it's the hope that I was coming, and I've told him that I was coming, kept him. And I'll talk to him every day until I was able to make it. He was still in hospital, but I was there. And we spent some good time together. Even though he was poorly, we'll come to the hospital, sit in the room with him, spend some time, talk, and then go back home. And the good thing is we even got him out of hospital. He got discharged stayed with him for a few more days and having the strong and supportive leadership team as well at the workplace also help mm -hmm. because my, my bosses mm -hmm. came to me and said take yeah. all the time you need if you need to extend the time that you're away for extend it just send me a, give me a call and let me know so i was there and i had the option to extend my holiday but i saw my dad was out of hospital and i thought okay let me go back we spoke i left on the 3rd of August. Arrived here on the 4th of August. Because of a time difference, that was already late in Sierra Leone. So they were already on the 5th. Mm -hmm. And then by 2 a.m. before, because normally I'll come back and then I'll call and say I've arrived. Because that's the call they were always eagerly waiting for. Mm -hmm. And then just for me to get a call around 2 a.m. I got up to use the washroom. Not knowing that, I saw lots of missed calls on my phone. And then at 2 o'clock, the call came to say my dad was gone. So it was shocking, but I did not even know. Sometimes the shock hits you in such a way that you don't even know how to respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I you, just... Mm -hmm. You said something about um, support at workplace, mm -hmm. and I think it's crucial. And I think I actually... Uh, benefited from that as well. Mm -hmm. So during the time of loss, my manager uh, 
give me all the time yeah. as well yeah. because sometimes you need that time because yeah. I had to travel. You don't have to And worry. then mm -hmm. these are some of those things because everything has to be emergency. You got to mm -hmm. uh, look for visa. You got to look for that. Uh, so many things has to be in place when you have to go back home. Mm -hmm. You have to. And many cases we are obligated to go back home in yeah. those cases. And that is the thing because it's unplanned. You need to get that support to be able to feel and not worry about some of those things. Mm -hmm. So lost my dad and the whole challenge started. My wife was with me. Her family was there supportive. The little community we live in in St. Paul, we have a huge Cameroonian family there. They all came, mothers, sons, children, to support my children, of course, were very supportive. We were able to rally and see what we can do prior to me traveling. And my wife said, no, this time you're not going alone. You need the support. And we traveled. We know it was going to cost an arm and a leg, mm -hmm. but we tried with the support from family. The, um, my old school, <laughs> like uh, Mr. Kemo said here, yeah, we came from the same school. We belong to some association. They also were able to rally and provided some financial support. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made it eventually to Sierra Leone, buried my dad. My mom became poorly from the time my dad passed away. And like you said earlier, Ron, you lost your paternal grandparent who happened to be my parent. Mm -hmm. um, five months after I lost my dad, my eldest brother, who was a surviving eldest brother, and that's the person that has been the forerunner, con like the contractor for all of our projects. Everything we're doing in Sierra Leone, he's the source, the person I go through. And unfortunately, he had a problem with his leg. Leg was amputated, got, uh, 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 which I believe must have been some blood poisoning when he got home around about Christmas. And in January, we lost him exactly five months after my dad. And then three months later, we lost my mom. So um, it is a challenging place to be in. And I think different people have different experiences. Mm -hmm. But like I was talking to Elder Nee yesterday, just in a privileged conversation, sometimes with the grieving, grieving process as well, it is individualized, yeah. but there is a cultural component to it as well. Yeah. See, having that support with people around you is important. And from that African perspective, people don't leave you on your own for, for, for a while. Say, for example, if a woman dies and uh, or the husband dies, a woman dresses in black and they stay in black for 90 days. They do nothing, mm -hmm. just getting that support from the family. Because it is, you have to go through a lot of emotional changes in your mind. Mm -hmm. What's tomorrow going to look like? This person that I've been used to for so many years, they're no longer here. Who do I call? There are sometimes you even pick up the phone one to call. Birthdays come. There are anniversary events that you knew you celebrated in a way because of the people that are attached to you. Mm -hmm. But now they are no longer there. So many gaps. And it takes time. It's not a one-day process. I think I'll pause there for now. Mm. Thank you, thank you. It's getting heavier. <laughs> mm. It's getting heavier as we go, but we all know that we all, like this is grief and loss for us, right? Um, Ni once said two things that are um, very constant in this life, uh, being Bef born and, death. and the day you die. And of course, we celebrate life and we grieve loss because, of course, these are relationships that we have built and we lose forever. Um, but let's hear your story of your loss. Well, mm -hmm. my loss is actually my daughter who was 32 years old when she passed. Um, she had three girls before she passed. The last one was just about close to a year or less. Uh, but what I have learned from that experience is actually learning from our experience to put in place a better way of dealing with that particular issue uh, as a traumatic event in our lives as we are in a foreign land. 
So my question and my effort now is more on how do we deal with these things because you can't stop death. Mm -hmm. no. And you don't choose it. So uh, how do we deal with it? Uh, relying on some of the experiences that have been shared here to put a system in place. Um, and everything is like a learning experience. Um, we had the COVID. We learned how to mobilize um, professionals, academics, um, pastors, and put them together. And each one of them brought a different set of service, whether it's counseling, whether it's praying, whether it's uh, you need medical attention, or even whether you need just friendship, you know, somebody to talk to. So I think that um, something that we can do moving forward is how do we put certain things in place so that by virtue of those things, um, we will deal with those traumatic experiences better. And as an African, there's always a way of doing things. And sometimes we move from that. And then we think we can create a new way of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. But after a while, we realize that we have to come back. And I always mention that in Ghana, we call it Sankofa because you know, you think you know better than your father. And so you try to abandon everything he has told you. And then you, you try to do try and error, try and error. But at some point, you come back and say, Daddy was right. Mm. And I think that as a people, that is where we are. Um, there is a global culture who doesn't belong to anybody. Those who will fall into the cracks, we adopt to that universal culture. And so somebody will say, oh, uh, it's a Canadian kid. No, it's not a Canadian kid. That's the popular culture. And popular culture cannot be identified with because everybody is indigenous to certain culture. And that's what has been proven to sustain you for all this time. Really. So if you've been here as a person of African descent, minimum one million years, and we've kept certain things in place and it's worked very well. So we came up as I referenced earlier, that we thought we knew better than our parents. But now we're coming to realize that all the new things that we are applying is actually not working. Mm -hmm. Because um, when somebody passes away, we mourn. When a child is born, we celebrate. Mm -hmm. So we have a new culture where sometimes I see on the poster when somebody passes away, what do you call it, obituary? Or Celebration like that. of life. Celebration of life. And then you ask the question as African, at what point do you celebrate death? Because there's two things, life and death. Mm -hmm. We mourn and we celebrate. So if you are an African, even I remember the day I was leaving Ghana, my family came to the airport, they were crying because I was living. Mm -hmm. And they were not sure when they would see me again. So any departure is mourning. So when you adopt this new phenomenon, new culture, celebration of life instead of habitual, what are you celebrating? You say, oh, it's going to a better place. Who told you that is a better place? There's no evidence anywhere that when you die, you go to a better place. So you are in delusion now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the reality is that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you're never going to see that person again. And that is a fact. But sometimes, as African people, we are challenged by our belief, which is perception. But when we prove to you the fact, because of that belief, you refuse to accept it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what is the belief? What is the, the fact? The fact is we sustain the family better than we are today. Mm -hmm. So that proof is there. We created the concept of a family and we function better and survive better within the context of the family. So the family is not an institution of the government. And you cannot take the family 
as an institution over the church. The church has to recognize that the family is an institution. Mm -hmm. And when the family functions better, the church will also function better. So you can't say, I'm creating a church family. There's no church family. If the family is weak, that church is weak. Mm -hmm. Because when you go to the family, you will see 80% of the people within the church are coming from broken homes. So where is the family? The family is where I'm responsible for you. You are responsible for me. Mm -hmm. So we coin the term, the spirit of Ubuntu. I am who you are, or I'm here because you are here. Mm -hmm. So this is the basis of the African culture that allow us to overcome. And if you don't believe me, then look at the people in the world who have overcome more than any other. We are overcomers mm -hmm. because of that belief system that I have a brother in you, I have an uncle in you, I have a sister in you. Every African woman is a mother. And these are the basis for our survival. So if you are ready to give that away, my question is, what do you replace this with? Beautiful. Beautiful. This is where we are. Beautiful. So with that, I hear. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Wow. We've had a very emotional conversation between myself and my fathers in the room. And because we're mindful of the viewers that are watching as well, we want for you to be able to take a breath and take care of yourself. We're going to cut this episode here for now and bring you part two next week. So until part two, please take care of yourself and sabe sandingding. <laughs>